So uh, today our Hello, speaker is, uh, so I'm just starting right now. Uh, yeah, so yeah. today our speaker is uh, Professor Shambhudu Shannal from Department of Physics, Isar uh, Thirupati. Uh, uh, what, what, what's your title? I just forgot. Uh, you are you are me asking me uh, talk about factorization and non-locality in quantum matter, and uh, Shambhudu, uh, this is basically 89th talk in the series. Uh, so you can start. First of all, you have to share your screen, and then start. Yeah, just to see the it. Okay, you can see the screen? Yes, yes. So you can start. Okay. Okay, first of all, thanks, Shantan, for giving me this nice opportunity to talk about some of the works I've been doing for last few years. And uh, this is, of course, a very active platform. Or for, and as you said, there are like 89 talks. And it's very, I'm happy to be here to be in this platform. Okay, so. My talk is about fractionalization and non-locality in quantum matter. And uh, since the talk has a relatively longer time than usual, so I thought I can maybe go a little more than usual what, I, what we do in a typical talk. So I'll basically plan to talk about two related problems. So these problems are namely, first, of all, first one is about interplay of fractional uh, fermionic quasi-particle and conventional magnetic orders in frustrated pyrochlor magnet. And as I progress in the talk, I will uh, unfold these complicated titles, which is um, in blue. And that is basically part of my introduction of the talk. And the second part I plan to talk about uh, magnetic response of quantum spin liquids in the presence of disorder. Again, the details of this terminologies will come as I progress in the talk. And my rough plan is to talk about the first one in, abs is, uh, in full detail. And then depending on how much time is left and how much it takes, we decide what to do about the second part. But there are two related problem and uh, somewhat related, but also can be discussed in isolation. So that's why the plan is like that. Okay, so in the first talk, my collaborators are uh, Kutsum and Shubro. Who are, Kusum is a faculty at IIT Palakkar, Fubra is faculty at ICTS, and this can be found in this particular publication. And uh, it's funded by mostly by DST SARV, is my main fund source of funding. And at present, I have a PhD student, Krishna, who is working on some related aspects of this problem. Okay, so let me start with a generic overview. And this generic overview is to talk mainly to elaborate on the title of quantum matter that what do one understand by quantum matter and to what does it fit in the whole program of condensed matter physics or solid state physics. So that I will explain that for as introduction and then I'll go to the details of the problem. So solid state physics is a very, uh, as we know that it's a very ancient subject. So understanding properties of solid in is the, probably the most ancient subject. You, when you study history, you see the book is written as Bronze Age, Iron Age, and all that, and modern Silicon Age, if you very not. So solid, understanding of solid is not a very, not something which started very recently, but formally the term solid state physics came around 1945 or so. And it was the amalgamation of all these subject of crystallography, metallurgy, electricity, and magnetism. and Around 1965 or so, so Anderson was one of the first person to, to change that or 
started labeling the class of problem which normally a solid state physics is concerned about to condensed matter physics because it turned out the range of problems is not just about physically solid objects but it could be like liquid like superfluid helium and all those things were kind of hot topic at that point of time and the studies of solid state physics extended towards nuclear matter and even like high energy physics when you add up this canopy of condensed matter physics all the condensed phase phases of matter and if you notice that lately that people have started calling this subject same class of objects they have started calling it quantum matter around 2008 most probably the term was coined by david pines but there was like david pines and robert laughlin had an article where they started calling it quantum matter and after that you can see there are several departments which are which call like to call themselves quantum matter institute or quant department of quantum matter so what what is that what did happen in between like um matter is anyway quantum it's made of objects of atom and molecule is supposed to follow the law of quantum mechanics but collectively whether it is quantum or not that depends on various factors whether you need to directly apply laws of quantum mechanics or not that depends on various factor but what decides that whether you call something quantum matter or not so let's go into that po point so in order to do that i like to show a diagram which is a very philosophical diagram with an axis called quantumness which is not a very strictly defined quantity and one can argue that what does it even mean and is if it is strictly correct so don't take it too seriously but it's a roughly uh, rough uh, picture of what do, what happens when one goes in more quantum systems so, so at the bottom of the axis i would like to put the solid the classical systems which we study in a textbook namely a solid glass liquid type of transitions or or the properties of solid glass and liquid which is a many body system where the, the description is entirely classical and as as i uh, as you know that this kind of system has this phase transitions which can be first order or second order and if second order system have this notion of spontaneous symmetry breaking like ferromagnet paramagnet and all that and there are also various kind of interesting phenomena cooperative phenomena like that where even at low temperature the system doesn't order and all those things and in the next in the rung will be a relatively like I, although as i said although the constituents of matter is atom or molecule but the collective description could be classical so for example superfluidity and superconductivity all these are strictly quantum phenomena they arise only in, as an artifact of a macroscopic wave function but you can have a effective description which is like a classical theory a similar theory as a classical phase transition like a landau ginzburg theory and like again the spontaneous symmetry breaking notion appears and more in the uh, as you go more in the um, quantumness direction the next thing comes is the metal band insulator semiconductor topological insulator on this modern topics and all which are basically a, a liquid or gas of non interacting electrons where the phenomena is strictly quantum the most of the interesting physics comes here because of uh, both of these are in some sense in a similar level most of the interesting physics comes because of the presence of a fermi surface and excitation which is a strictly quantum phenomena and superconductivity superfluidity is of course some kind of condensate but although you can have a effective classical description and the final point in this uh, ladder is or this axis is which what i would like to call uh, what uh, what is normally termed as quantum matter although it is uh, all these things can be in some sense called quantum matter but the, but the term is reserved for this class of systems where the effect of quantum mechanics is prominent at all level like you cannot even have a, a, a effective classical description or anything like first of all it's strictly quantum and all the aspects of quantum mechanics are in major player in this segment for example like not only the superposition and all but the entanglement is very important in this category and that's why you need effective non local the, the low energy physics or the ground state physics is non local to begin with and thus it's not in the domain of uh, perturbation perturbation theory or anything so you need to begin with a strong correlation theory and that that has some peculiar consequences some of them includes like fractional 
excitations or something. I and I will elaborate on all those. And examples include like Mott insulator, high TC superconductor, magic angle graphene, which is a very new thing, fractional quantum Hall effect, and so on. And as you see, as I have written here, that each of these understanding of each of these category of problems have led to major technical technological changes. We changed our impacted our life uh, quite a lot. For example, as you know, the early days of this of the solid liquid gas is like behind the industrial revolution and so on. And ferromagnet, paramagnet, all these things you know already. Like Silicon Age is entirely our, our understanding of electron as a as a basic excitation and it's and what happens when that is the, your main carrier of of your charge or heat. And as we st we stand at the position of this quantum matter phase. Um, hopefully, it is uh, it it is a starting point for quantum technology, so-called quantum technologies, where possibly the carrier of your electricity or any other thing like heat or anything, it could be a not a electron but a fractional object or some ex exotic quasi particle, which is coming from a a many-body correlated ground state, a highly entangled non-local correlated ground state. So that is the promise or the possibility, and that is why this subject is very interesting, not only intellectually, but also from a technological point of view. So with that introduction, let me start with a general model, which is the playground of all of these physics. And uh, let's look at that what happens when this general model the, to some special cases of this general model, and that is what we'll focus with. And the general model is the most is the simplest possible model you can think of for electrons on a lattice. And there are only two type of uh, object present, two type of fundamental ingredients present. One is uh, Coulomb interaction, and another is quantum laws of quantum mechanics. No other force, no other interaction, and everything else is emergent. So the model is the Hamiltonian is given by uh, this. Um, a Tij term, which is a hopping, which denotes the electron is hopping from site I to site J. So, so site I to site J. And there is a mu term, which is an on site uh, potential or some on site chemical potential. And finally, a Coulomb term, which is when two multiple electrons try to come on the same site, there is an energy penalty. In the same physical site, but of course, different state, there is an energy penalty for that repulsive Coulomb interaction. So a Mott insulator, so as you know that all the metals and the standard textbook thing appears so in the, the interaction is weak and you can effectively describe the system as a single particle picture or a single electron roaming in a lattice or some back frozen background. But when the U is strong, my U is the dominant scale compared to T, then what happens is, is then what you get is Mott insulator. So here is a cartoon picture of a Mott insulator. And uh, as you can see that, let's say these positives are ions, which are static in a, are in a static in some lattice positions in a solid. And the electrons are the outer shell loose electrons, which are roaming around freely. That is the picture of a metal. And that is what you have learned in, in some textbook level everywhere. And as you uh, you know, this is, is effectively same picture gives you sort of all these other things like semiconductors and all where some other complications arise, which I'm not going into. But let's see what happens when there is a strong interaction, which means the electrons are are kind of are there is a high penalty for the electrons to hop from one lattice point to another lattice point. So then the electron will like to stick at its own lattice point. But then there is a spin component of the electron. So electron is a charge and spin. So the charge is frozen because of the Coulomb, uh, Coulomb energy penalty, but the spin need not be frozen. So it turns out you can do a second order perturbation theory and show that the spins do a virtual hopping. So because of this virtual hopping process, which is suppressed by a scale of T square by U, of order T square by U, then the spins can have can move around and you get an effective Heisenberg model or effective spin interaction model for this system. So although it's a charge insulator, but it has a spin dynamics. And then one more, so this is already an example of a fractionalized phase where you have the electron charge and spin are separate. 
Now there are one more thing happens after that, which I'm going to talk in much more detail later. So when you when you talk about this class of systems called quantum spill liquid and so on, then you can show because in some special scenario, you can visualize these individual spins or can also be visualized as made of other subparticles, namely partons. And those that could be bosonic or fermionic, but this this can exist only in such a correlated environment. Not in, a free electron cannot be fractionalized, of course. So that is what uh, what we'll see, and that is what I mean by fractionalization, and that is and non-local physics. And I, I will also elaborate on the point non-local, but roughly you can imagine that the, when there is an entangled ground state, then the non-locality is kind of important. So let's start with a simple example. So this simple example is that of a ordered magnet with a product ground state. So I have a Mott insulator where uh, there is no peculiar competition or no special kind of interaction, it's simple square lattice. And it is it will going to settle as an antiferromagnet. So the spins are point will point up, down, up, down, up, down like that. And once you specify in such an ordered state, when you need to, when you specify the direction of one spin, the rest is determined. So that's that's what we know as spontaneous symmetry. Break. So if that is a, a spontaneous symmetry breaking means that you can describe the whole system in terms of a single order parameter, and here that, that order parameter is summing the spins in the odd side and even side, where you know in the other type of site you take a minus of the spin because otherwise if you just sum it it will become zero as you in a ferromagnet it's of course you can just sum the spins so there is a single order parameter to describe the whole system and this system can have local excitation which means if you if you flip one spin that is a local it's physically a local excitation so that's the lowest possible excitation in this system now if you make it complicated actually so for example, it can be a frustrated, uh, some frustrated environment or something. You can show that the lowest possible excitations are not even local. Like in one spin, you cannot, if you excite just flip just one spin, that's a very high energy thing, but you can do several spins in some loop or some non-local fashion that will give you some low energy excitations, but that's a separate problem, but I am just stating it that that might be useful or relevant later. So. Let's, this one has just local excitation. And here is an example of a situation where it is the excitation itself is could be non-local in, in because of some, some complication in the Hamiltonian. And I will describe in a moment what kind of complication, but let's just look at the state and look at what does it mean by a state when which will have a non-local excitation. So one example is VBS ground state, it's called valence bond solid where the neighboring spins will form some singlet and the whole system will be a singlet singlet orientation and they will all orient in some direction. And that breaks some symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Now, there could be liquid like state. And when I use the word solid and liquid in this context, I mean something which is long range order versus something which is not. So a liquid like state doesn't break any symmetry as we know. And a, ex one example could be where these singlets are oriented in some random way. So normally you, you have no reason in, a, in it unless there is some strong anisotropy in a, in a general model. So these singlets will be oriented in randomly and the actual ground state of the system will be a superposition of all this possibility. And then there are examples where the system can have can form singlet in long range, in very long distance. It's not so easy to understand when and why that happens. So in the second part of the talk, I'll give you an example of where that happens. And you can imagine when you can have excitations on this system, which means you give some energy and break one of those singlets, then you will get a free spin. So these things are, and that spin can roam around in that uh, system. And that could be a low energy process. That's one example of a fractionalized excitation in this kind of a entangled ground state. Okay, so one main definition of this kind of a entangled ground state is that the psi GS cannot be written in product form of individual and local components. So you, you might be, I mean, these are simple examples. For example, this one is a simple example. Here you can write the psi GS as a local product form of some local, not if not individual, but local pair of singlets. But there are more complex examples, and you'll see the more of them. In, in just next slide, you'll see that. Where you cannot write in, in a product form of any individual constant in any basis, no suitable basis transformation will allow it. 
so such a system is a highly entangled has a highly entangled and non local ground state what is the character of excitations on such a ground state is is the main question of interest and there are two leading example of which we know one is fractional quantum hall system and another is spin liquids and here i'm going to talk about the spin liquids at least one root two so that kind of a highly non local entangled ground state so here is an example where it can happen so the it's a it's simplest possible example that let's say i have three spins on a triangle and it's an ising interaction which means the spins will like to orient anti ferromagnetically so it's afm and iz so that means if the spin is up this has to be down so if the, for example if i put them on a square lattice it is up down down up so no problem but if i put it on a triangle then i cannot satisfy that so it has to be misaligned with at least one of the partners and there are multiple ways to satisfy that and for a triangle there are actually six configuration which has the lowest possible energy but cannot satisfy the constant everywhere so this kind of scenario is called a frustrated system the frustrated magnet and as you know that if as you can imagine from here that if i have a macroscopic number of spins or a or a full system of 10 to the power 23 particles has this kind of in a lattice then there are infinitely many or macroscopic number of mini minimum energy configuration and in the quantum ground state is basically superposition of all this configuration and there is no way to separate them in any local form or any local not only lo not only individual but also any local basis so such a system is a highly entangled uh, has highly entangled ground state and that is one route to go towards a highly entangled and non local ground state so that is the route we will discuss in this talk and once we establish that frustrated magnet is a route to go to that kind of a ground state let's now move on to talk about some of the materials which can be interesting in this context and see how can i write down a hamiltonian model for that material then i'll talk about some experiments which gives i hope that there might be something interesting going on in terms of this non local physics or at least something going on which you cannot explain within the paradigm of the known classical spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, picture or maybe you can but with some extra complications we'll talk about that uh, those some of those experiment briefly and then we'll try to construct a theory for what happens to general in general for that kind of problems and that is basically our work and then i'll talk about future direction in this part of the talk so first point is this material to model so let's see what do we need what are the ingredients we need for a material so we need of course a correlated charge insulator that's what we established we need spin half uh, spins as our main degree of freedom it's not a essential criteria because very recently there are new, new experiment which are higher spin objects but spin half has the maximum quantum fluctuation so spin half is useful to have it's not the essential criteria and then we need a geometric frustration or exchange for some kind of interaction frustration and hopefully i'm this is not a essential criteria but as we see, we'll see that if it is present like some exotic interaction like spin orbit coupling which breaks the time reversal symmetry that can gives rise to some interesting physics so these are the four candidate materials which is known to us one is a kagome or triangular lattice and the compounds are like these are all some kind of a colorful crystals like j crystal gems and uh, kagome triangular is um, uh, usually you see this harbard smithite and all these other kind of other kind of compounds as i have listed here and they have the problem of disorder actually that is why we will discuss about the disorder in the less, later part it's not easy to synthesize such a material without disorder strictly 2d kagome system but this is historically the first known candidate of quantum spin liquid and another class of material is kitaev material this is also i'll talk about a little bit in the later half of the talk and some recent example include this sodium iridate and ruthenium chloride category so the main exciting part of this kitaev material is that they are the the model to describe them are exactly solvable at least in some limit not entirely because the actual material has the exact solvable plus plus some interaction 
but it's close to some very idealized models. And then there is another class of problem like organics, which are like organic material. And there are, uh, they are also very interesting because they, very recently there are some experiments and last few years on this where one can control many things and do the magnetic measurements. And finally, this talk is about rare earth pyrochlores. So people have identified the rare earth as, the, as like the new oil of this quantum technologies, oil in the sense that those who possess more rare earth material, they have an advantage. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting situation where people are trying to see where who has the maximum amount of this kind of object to mine. So what are these rare earth pyrochlores? So rare earth pyrochlores are compounds which has the formula A2B2O7, where A is from the rare earth segment of periodic table, B is some transition metal, and it's an oxide of that. So it's magnetic correlated charge insulator and had the right property. So it has an interpenetrating pyrochlor structure. And we are mainly interested about this, uh, about this A, the green one, because that is the responsible for the magnetic properties here. So it has some desirable property for the kind of physics we are looking for. It has this localized 4F electron or Hund rules, by Hund rule, which you can see that. And it has this strong spin orbit coupling for which this local J eigenstates, they split by the crystal field and gives an effectively, even though they are like higher spin objects, but they give an effectively doublet structure because of the crystal field effect. And that's why you can write down a effective model effective low energy model, which is a spin half model for this doublet, which has a natural local quantization axis. So starting from the ab initio well, calculation of like atoms and molecules. And here is the model which one can write down for this kind of a system. So it has this peculiar interaction. So this is a pyrochlor structure. So, okay, so when I say this term, that means it is along this local Z axis. And this J plus minus is basically this SI plus SI my SJ minus is SX plus ISY, which is for this local XY axis. So the model is of course much more complicated than um, uh, Heisenberg model because it, it breaks all these symmetries. It breaks the time reversal and um, sorry, it doesn't break the time reversal. It breaks the rotational symmetry, the spin rotational symmetry. And that's why it, it is not just Heisenberg. So it's JZZ, J plus plus is the Heisenberg part. But in addition, it has this J plus minus plus minus and JZ plus minus. So that has some interesting consequences as we'll see. Now there is, uh, so this is the these are the parameters of the model in the local basis. Now we can rewrite this also in the global basis where instead of saying this quantization axis along this one, this is, this is my Z axis, local Z axis, which connects the center with the, with the vertex. So instead of that, if I, I can take a global Z axis also, and in that basis, the model can be also rewritten in this form. So it, since it's not a Heisenberg form, so it's not a dot product, but it's a tensor product with all the possible combination, which gives you a scalar edge. So this is the form. So let's say this is my local axis, X, Y, and Z, and this is my global axis. And these are the four type of bonds you will see in that. One is the X, Y type with respect to local bond. Then there is some Ising type and symmetric of diagonal exchange. And there is a special kind of torque term called DM terms. We'll talk about that later. So this is the model and these are the parameters in global basis. And these are the symmetries of the system, which is And the third question you ask is normally is, is the most important question that is there non-local excitation? And I will show you in a moment that the most important probe for that is inelastic neutron scattering. And the another probe for useful probe is thermal conductivity, but it, that experiment is not easy to do. So these, some of them are marked in color, which are the experiments which are already done for this kind of system. So that's why it's a kind of more important in this context. 
further you can ask the question what, what about what is the nature of the excitation and that you can again get from this inelastic neutron scattering and that gives you some information another thing is the raman or optical properties which is something a very recent experiments are happening on that which, which talks about these aspects of that and finally some kind of a special property like some local measurement of thermal hot so these are the five category on experiment and here i'll talk about these few things mainly i'll talk about the inelastic neutron scattering a little bit about the specific heat and back so what is what kind of information do you read off from the inelastic neutron scattering so you know that the scattering cross section is uh, is the one which you measure from any scattering experiment and one can show from linear response theory the main object that contributes there is the spin spin correlation function the two two point correlation function which which can is a special profile alpha beta at the spin component r r prime at the special location and zero at t at two different times so it's a dynamical correlation function you do a fourier transform of that put the magnetic form factor and then you put the dipole factor then you get the full neutron scattering but the most interesting thing here is this object so we can calculate that part very easily i mean not very easily but somewhat we can calculate that theoretically and whatever new theory or new kind of model you are going to propose you have to show that this calculation this thing is kind of at least qualitatively capture the experimental aspects so what what is what should we look for so what are the signatures so a normal scattering event is basically when you have the when the main excitations are magnons or like this local spin flip excitation is following that a neutron with with some omega k is some linear momentum omega some angular momentum and s is some spin will scatter and scatter of an electron and and it will it will produce uh, this scattering process will produce a neutron and a magnon which will have this magnon will have this spin one so therefore there must be a spin half to balance the spins and that will be the spin the neutron will go with that kind of a spin in in this scattering process and is this this whole thing will have a well defined energy momentum relationship because of this energy conservation and all that so you will get a sharp peak or sharp line of this in this energy momentum conservation but if there is a spin on which means this magnon split into there are substructures or there are fractional quasi particles of spin ons then there is no so these can be split into any arbitrary arbitrary energies and when that object interacts with a with a neutron then there that will have no dispersion so it could be a continuous diffuse spectra when there is some such a scattering so what does it look like when there is spin on present or not so this is a, a some theoretical and experimental plot of this neutron scattering experiment the y axis is energy the x axis is momentum in some special direction it's not the full momentum because the full momentum is some higher dimensional object but this is some special uh, direction along the angle or some ang or along the diagonal direction or something and the first line of plot is a experimental plot for a particular system this experiment and it was done the claim is that it is done for a highly perfect sample a single crystal and that's why this this fuzzy part you can say oh it's some disorder but the claim is that it's not it is something related to the physics now this second line is a theoretical calculation of spin wave theory which assumes no fractional excitation and you can see some very well defined sharp peaks which comes from the dispersion relation but this one has a sharp peaks plus some background fuzzy background and the question is why why is there a fuzzy background there are multiple ways to think about that and we'll, we'll see and so on so as you turn and you, as you increase so this number is some magnetic field and as you increase the magnetic field or reduce the magnetic field you can see with increasing magnetic field the fuzzy background disappeared so that is kind of that kinds of say that it is more getting more and more uh, ordered which is possible because as you turn on a magnetic field you, you freeze the elect the spins in one direction so fluctuations gets reduced so the but still the fuzzy background doesn't disappear so it's possible it could be from some fractional so 
this is another set of experiment which was done a little a relatively uh, this one the earlier one was 2011 this is 2017 and the conclusion is roughly same except some minor disagreement which is when you try to fit the this these strong lines using this uh, from the model i have described before you can you can read of the numbers from the fitting and the fitting there is a slight disagreement not very slight it's actually quite strong disagreement that is a zz term so as you can see the zz term is the ising term one of them says that there is the ising term is negligible another say no no ising term is important but nevertheless irrespective of that disagreement that disagreement will turn out to be useful but irrespective of that disagreement the roughly the picture is the same the qualitative picture so this is the uh, ice limit so the, just to show that what happens when jzz is much higher than all other so as i can see that in this experiment suggests that the jzz is higher and this experiment say no no that is not so important so it turns out when the jzz the local z axis is very strong then this thing like to order in some like a water ice like ice order of two pin spin pointing in two spin pointing out that's called a spin ice so that has is very interesting physics of its own but here we will not talk about that just to mention that and you can see that there low energy description of that one can one might have to introduce a compact qed description but here i will not talk about that so here is a summary of all the experiments so if i plot the make a qualitative plot that of this uh neutron scattering patterns and put it on the magnetic field you see that as you increase increase the magnetic field the system gets more and more ordered but at low magnetic field there is a lot of fluctuation and that fluctuation is that coming from spin on or something else that's one of the question and the ordering temperature is suppressed and this is the mean field calculation but the actual observation is much smaller and that one can read off from this kind of a specific heat uh, measurements so now we will try to construct a theory for all this observation okay so at this point i think i can pause a little bit for questions okay if none let me proceed so the theory have must capture the following effects first a suppression of an ordering temperature this quantum or classical fluctuation that we don't know a priori and there are competing theories which says no no it's quantum or some would say no no it's classical and that's so the, the theory must address that point then the next point is the what is the scattering continuum coming from is it a uh, is it because of spin on or some other effect like fluctuation from other classical phase or something else and i'll describe in a moment to show you that why why one might think one way or the other and then the third point as we saw the, in the, in these lines in this neutron scattering lines we saw that there is a coexistence of the bright line and the fluctuation so does that mean that a magnetic long range magnetic order and spin on can coexist so that is another question we like to see if the, whatever theory you construct must address that point and nature of the spin ons also is important because it seems it suggests they are they are gapless or uh, some cases it could be gapped or are they topological or not that we cannot say from these experiments but at least we can predict that what are the possibilities and finally can one predict something for further experiments such as thermal transport so that's the goal of the theory for this that's what we want to do so let's see how to uh, how to construct such a theory so this is the classical phase diagram of this particular system as i said there are four parameters but instead of the four parameters here we are plotting taking a cut in this four dimensional parametric space a suitable cut where these experimental points lie on the same same plane so that's how the cut was selected and you will see this as a beautiful phase diagram and that phase diagram was worked out using uh, spin wave theory which one can do by by writing down the hamiltonian c do some group theory analysis to show what are the possible irreducible representation how many ways you can break the symmetries to find the spontaneously broken symmetric phases and then that shows there are three four main phases these phases the ordering looks like this one is a ferromagnetic phase and the ferromagnetic phase somewhat looks like this it's not easy to visualize it because it's on a pyrochlor but it's a ferromagnetic phase in a local sense so 
there is a ferromagnetic phase and then there is this some phase called psi 3 some phase called psi 2 and then there is a pamat chakar phase there is a rough picture of how these phases look like and in the long range uh, how their long range ordering look like now one competing point on competing theory people say that because the experimental points are at close to the border of two phases except this one close to the uh, this particular is the one which we just discussed the experiment since they are border of two phases maybe the fluctuation of the other phase is causing this fuzzy background so there is no but then the question is then why there is a bright line at all why there is a long range order at all if the fluctuation is killing the order then why there is a li line at all so that's what we will try to see that what could be other possibility of that fluctuation so here is a rough outline of how these order parameters look like in terms of the local spins so this is a all in all out order so it's a, you get this by adding the spins and subtracting in some other sub other sub um, a subgroup of points and these are the order parameters which is worked out in this paper using this uh, group theory and uh, this is how they look like so if i write down the hamiltonian in terms of this order parameter which is just nothing but a suitable linear combination so normally when you have a ferromagnetic order i will come that in a moment i'll show you how to do that for ferromagnets you just write is that in terms of the ferromagnetic order parameter here instead you have some very complicated order parameter so that's why you have to do some non trivial exercise to write it down in this form in terms of this new order parameter and that is how the hamiltonian looks like when you write down in terms of this it's just a transformation so now how do how one can work out this kind of a phase diagram so let me tell a little bit about that and it's a very classic textbook exercise that once you have identified which is a non trivial exercise to identify all the possible ways to break break the orders and find these five order parameters once you identified them then it is not hard at all and that's a simple textbook exercise so let's consider a spin half heisenberg model on a pyrochloride it's just heisenberg no other peculiar term or anything so if it is for some reason let's say if it is ferromagnetically ordered or let's just say some order so then i should be able to write it at jij mi dot mj form that is what is being done in this case so the j effectively the jijs are these a parameters and all that so i should be able to write it in some form like that then i do a standard textbook min field theory which is it start with some min field and add some fluctuation from the main field and when i do that i effectively reduce this interacting problem into a non interacting problem if i in exclude the fluctuation the second order fluctuations so then such a mean field theory is the is called the curie wise mean field theory and you can work out the ordering temperature and everything from there but how will you do such a thing if there is a phase which doesn't break any symmetry which is the spin liquid phase or so on this kind of parton phase it doesn't break any symmetry so there is no combination of m no combination of the spins which is some m which is non zero ever anywhere in any parameter value or anywhere so that means the average mi is zero so you cannot write a theory like that so for that you have to think of something else and that is what is this a mean field theory for this quantum matter phase or a partonic theory so the idea is following that you represent the spin operators in terms of spin half quasi particle operators which was originally introduced by baskar and anderson for different purpose but roughly the idea is same so you write down the spin operator as some a a dagger sigma a and that is basic a can be boson or fermion or anything so they are like the patterns and when you write down such a thing then your problem becomes so at this point i'm describing it like a mathematical trick to solve this problem but i'll show in a moment that why it is also not just a mathematical trick but when you are writing each spin operator in terms of another fermion operator you are doubling the hilbert space at every point so to bring back the for a faithful representation of one to one representation you have to add the constraint of half filling which is sum of this a dagger a is one so when you do that then you have a one to one map and the exact representation and the next point is that this partons can have a life as a own as a true quasi particle of the system as we will see it's not just a mathematical trick of solving the problem when the si expectation value is always zero 
so what what the mean field theory of such a thing will look like so let's say i have this kind of a term a heisenberg term so now i replace this by these two parton terms and let's assume these partons are fermionic so instead of the a i am using the f operators so this is my fermionic form and now i can do a mean so now what did i do so i started with a two body problem and i converted a two body means it's an interacting spin problem and i farm going to the fermionic basis it's a four body problem so it's still a difficult problem it's 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 not it's neither easy to solve but one can now do a mean field theory in this fermionic basis now if you do the mean field theory like this this is basically just like the mean field theory we just discussed but that need not be the only possibility so once you have written this four fermi terms you can group them in many different ways and each of these grouping is a, should be in a form that so this one is going to break the symmetry but you can do the grouping in many different ways such that it doesn't break any symmetry then you can still have a effective mean field description which is symmetry preserving not symmetry breaking and that is the main point of this kind of a phase that it doesn't break in do a spontaneous symmetry breaking so when you write and group them so that is one possibility so and then there is another possibility which is like this so you can see here it is a, it's a hopping hopping and pairing pairing is separate so this is like an effective superconducting uh, term where a pair hops not a single object and this is a single particle hopping uh, form so now is that all i mean that that seems to be very simple so i will come in a moment to to tell you that this is there are some catch into this in this picture so let me tell a little bit about it here so the catch is following so let's say i have a j psi dot sj and let me think of the simplest representation which means the i am not using the f language because i am using the f language for something else so let me use a slightly different language so the simplest possible fermionic splitting is ci dagger ci minus 2 si z ci up ci up minus ci down ci down and so on so if this is ci plus you can like write down the ci minus and then we have to add this constant to for a faithful representation and the constant is basically ci up dagger ci up ci down dagger ci down is equal to 1 okay. but then you will immediately recognize the problem so then uh, just to note how this thing looks like so this thing will be basically A, a term like this, so J by two, C I alpha dagger, C J alpha, C I beta dagger, C J beta. So this four Fermi term, which can be written in in terms of this two Fermi terms, and that will look like C I alpha dagger, C J alpha, K I I J, plus so on. And I'm not going into the details of that. So this K I I J. Includes these pair terms, and that is your effective uh, low in a, a effective mean field theory, which has some approximation that I am assuming that I can decouple this. But can I do that? And when I do this, make such a approximation, what are the consequences of that? So one thing you notice immediately that this C I, what is the meaning of this C I dagger operator in this space? C I up operator, let's say. so this ci plus operator when it acts on a ground state of this problem it immediately throws it out of the ground state why because this con constraint is telling you there will be one particle at each side for all i so this is the number operator one up spin one down spin and the total number must be one so if i create a part particle a, a create a spin on so these things are called spin ons or partons that means i have i have gone out of the hilbert space of the problem so what to do about that so one solution is to do the following is to look at this lattice so let's say you have pumped one particle here so that means you have to take away one particle from here but where will that particle go that particle will go here but if it goes here then there you have disturbed the balance so then this guy will go here so immediately you will see a non local string of event just by the action of creating one particle okay so now what to do about that so if, if to what to do with this non local string so the only way to deal with the non local string 
or stop this string is to create or destroy another particle elsewhere. So it will create this, this loop or of this, this pair creation. And if it is 1D, there are only two ways, uh, left or right. But if it is 2D, there are many ways, 2D or 3D, there are many ways to do that. So this thing can be actually captured in the form of a gauge of a gauge field. So you can balance, the, you can show that if I have a gauge transformation, which is like this, e to the power minus i gamma i, c i sigma dagger. So if this is, if I want to say that my object, my, my thing is gauge invariant, which you can rewrite. The reason I'm writing this, because you can express this gauge, this gauge form as this e to the power i, comma i c i up dagger c i up plus c i down dagger c i down minus one. So now if, if this acts on the on any physical state psi that will maintain this constant is appears as that so it appears as this gauge form. Now you can show you can you can deal with this problem of a non-local fluctuation with using a gauge field. You can introduce a gauge field at each lattice site at each bond so a i j at each bond and that can take care of this fluctuation and you can write a non-local operator using that gauge field so it is not just very simple to just think that i have uh, i can replace the spins by these fermions but i have to think if i have to have these fermions have to have a life of its of their own then because of the hilbert space constant they are essentially non-local so it's a non-local physics uh, for this apparently you know, not simple in non-interacting fermion. Now, how do I deal with that? So I will come in a moment, I'll show you that when you can do mean field theory at many different levels. You can do it at the level where you consider, consider these gauge fluctuations as frozen. So it's like a static gauge field and apply this constant on average, not at each side. So that will be a zeroth order theory. And then you get, lift that and give them a dynamics like add some Maxwell term. And then you show that how the dynamics, is the dynamics stable, keeps the whatever result you got earlier stable. So we will, that is what we'll do. And one more point to notice that this AIJ gauge field can have, there are two types of things at least possible in these 3D systems. So one is it can be continuous from a zero to pi or it can be discrete as zero pi. So this is the U1 spin liquid and this is a Z2 spin liquid. So it's a crude physical meaning for that. And then there is, a, there is a whole framework to take care of this problem. This is called projective symmetry group framework. That's what we do to, to look at all the possible fluctuation and all the possible uh, way you can write down this main field theory, this, this part on theory. So here are the possibilities in, uh, compressed in one page. So there are only four possible ways to do that. So there are only four possible ways to write down the pair this, these two fermions. And these possible ways, so this is a singlet hopping where a particle hops from one side to another. This is a triplet hopping with some, with some spin factor in the middle. There is a pairing, singlet pairing and the triplet pairing terms. Now, how do I know that what, how I should split? Because as I said, there are these four Fermi operators, F dagger, F dagger, F, F. There are infinitely many ways to split them. How do I how do I know that how will I split them in terms of these thing, these four things? I'm not infinitely many ways, but there are many ways to split them. So that is driven by the phenomenology of the problem. So for example, once you write down this, so here is an example of a Heisenberg term. So if I express these in terms of the spin-on operator, and then and I express these in terms of this operator, these are the terms. Now you can read off from here that if you try to do a mean field theory, some of them will be unstable. Some of them will be stable because of the signs here. Moreover, you can have some guidance from the phenomenology because the, let's say the phenomenology says, or the experiment says they are, they are all gapless excitation. Then chances are there that, that this is a Z2 field. So this Z2 and U1 spin liquid have the property that the gas fluctuation in one case is gapped, another case is gapless. So then there are possibilities that you can probably get rid of also the superconducting terms. So this is the kind of guidance you get from the experiment and to construct the theory. So the, our goal is to construct a part on theory, which preserves all the symmetry 
and gets us as close as possible to the experiment and the experimental phenomenology, at least qualitatively at the zeroth order, where I don't consider the gauge fluctuation and keeps the gauge fields as, as a constant or static. Now, if I am able to do that, then the next question is to ask, is it stable with respect to the gauge fluctuation? So that is the whole program. So Let's do some of the some of the, so as I said that you choose by phenomenology symmetry and energetic so you'll also see which one reduces the energy more and then there this is not so easy because for a Kagome lattice for Kagome systems there is a debate going on for many years so somebody says it's C1 somebody says no no it is it two and that is there is no end to that debate so and the experiment seems to be fuzzy about which one to choose okay so our work, uh, there was a complementary work. I forgot the publication ID. So that was working with a separate answers, but which is something also worth looking at. So let's show that a little bit quickly. I show that what happens when you do such a mean field theory and how does such a mean field theory look like? So here is the crudest possible form where I just keep the chi and I drop throw away anything else. So that will have a form like this. And it, this is the chemical potential which, you, which must balance this par site uh, constant. And this is my quantum order parameter or some order parameter which preserves the symmetry. And it will have a frozen e to the power ij. And this, so here, if I satisfy this constant on average, not on each side, then I can assume that the, the gauge field is not there or at least frozen. So that is the that is the meaning of a zero order mean field theory, and as I mentioned, that these fluctuations describe the excitations above that point, so which I don't consider in this zero order theory. So this is a, could be another separate. Uh, the next thing to do is to study the dynamics of this gauge field. Okay, so the question we ask that how good a starting point is provided by this zero order mean field theory, which means how close I can get to the phenomenology from the experiment. So that is the question. So in order to address that, and of course, after that, we have to do the stability analysis to see the fluctuation and the spin-ons. So that is what we'll talk about. So let's, and also if you remember that I said that if you look at the experimental point, there are this, this fuzzy background with some bright lines, which indicates a coexistence of magnetic order with the quantum spin liquid phase. That is also something we will try to address here, where the magnetic field or the magnetic part is given by this, and the QSL part is given by this. And I want to write my Hamiltonian splitting into these both parts at the same time, and try to see which one tries to stabilize or minimize the energy. Now, when you do that, since you are writing your same Hamiltonian in terms of this defined channel, there will be some interact, some relation between this in the mathematical form between this channel and this channel and all this. So this is a simplified form, which I write down after doing some symmetry analysis. And I'll tell briefly about that, why it is so. If I don't do that, it's a very complicated big form. Actually, there are, so here you can see there are only parameters like chi and ez and nothing else. Well, there is also e ex and ey. So this is the, this has actually 48 parameters, if you can see. So because this is a pyrochlore, and this pyrochlore has one, two, three, four, five, six bonds, and each bond has like uh, this a chi and three e x e y e z. So that's six into four, 24, and then there are they are complex valued. So there are 48 parameters, and by symmetry analysis, I can show only two of them are independent; rest are all dependent to each other, which is another important step in this process. So now I can I am writing down the same Hamiltonian splitting it into two part. One is the magnetic part, another is the QSL part with a factor of alpha. So this factor alpha takes care of the relation between these parameters, which strictly speaking should be determined with a full algebraic and, and that could be another dynamical parameter in your mean field theory. But here we treat it with some zeroth order approximation as a factor which I can tune. So that means since this alpha must be somewhere between zero and one, and we put up some values, and we see that which first factor is more relevant or more close to the phenomenology. Okay, so now let me show the results from after we do this theory, what, what is the result we get? So here is the modified phase diagram we propose. So this phase diagram in the earlier one, as you, if you remember, there were all these phases, but now the new points are this rate, 
red region, which is a quantum spin liquid phase. All these red regions are pure quantum spin liquid phase. And this experimental point falls in this. And then there is something neighboring to that. Of course, the experimental point need not be taken too seriously because those order param those parameters were extracted on a lot of assumptions. So, that, so our point is not to just go to that particular experiment, but rather say, what are the possibilities in this class of systems and over across the various space diagram? So if the material is not here, it must be somewhere else, but at least what is possible in principle. So one possibility is this pure kick in quantum spin liquid phase, and then there are some colored region which are coexisting, which means they coexist with the magnetic order and the spin liquid. And if you do their, uh, look at their phase uh, neutron scattering, you will see that uh, this bright line coexisting with this fuzzy background. And then there is further, we analyze those phases and we found that some of these phases are topological, which means they have some non-trivial topological index. That means, so these are called fractional topological insulators. The spin-on band structure has a non-trivial topology. This is also very interesting and can lead to some non-trivial transport properties. Remember the spin-ons doesn't have any charge. Spin-ons or patterns doesn't have any charge. They just have spin. So the only thing they can carry is heat. So they one have to do this thermal transport to see any kind of non-trivial topology. So undo this thermal all effect type things. So here are the band structures and the neutron scattering structure factor as we calculate from our theory. And we can see that you get this uh, some kind of a, uh, this kind of a spin on like background as you expect. And at least qualitatively they are similar to the experiments. And most interesting thing to read off here is whether they are gapless or gapped. So based on the parameter values, you can get these gapless excitations, which means very low energy excitations. And gap means there is no excitation here. So they are all gapped excitations. So all these kind of interesting possibilities are there. So this is the 3D Brillouin zone on some special points. So these gamma points are basically the K000 point. And you see then the K000 point has like, uh, is gapped in this case. And, and it's gapped in all the cases except here. And one more interesting thing we captured, which is also if you increase the magnetic field, this phase gets weaker. So here, these islands are in this background. So X axis and Y axis are some parameters and uh, are parameters as in this diagram. These are these parameters. So, and this AZ is the strength of the magnetic field. So if I turn on the magnetic field, you can see the spin liquid islands get smaller and smaller, which means they are unstable with respect to the magnetic field. And that is what we know from the happens in the experiment and we captured it at least in our pattern theory. So it seem, seemingly we propose this as a can, good candidate theory, but as I said that whether it's applicable particularly for this material or not, that is, a, that is a subject to debate because there are possibility of this other place fluctuation and all that. Okay, so here is a summary of these results. So as we see that what we can, could capture within our theory is the suppression of ordering temperature, which is a competition between quantum and classical order. We can capture the scattering continuum of spin-ons and the coexistence of spin-on and classical order. And most importantly, and most interestingly is this uh, possibility of gap, gapless and topological phases at this various point. And prediction for other materials in the sense because we are scanning the whole phase space even though we are not specifically stuck with this yb 2 ti 207 Okay, so here is a quick summary of the plans which we want to do immediately now. And one of these is to improve the zeroth order I mean, because the, all this we are saying is a very crude mean field theory. The very important question is, is it stable? If I add the fluctuations, which we can do in many various, various different ways. And there are various kinds of mean field approximations here. First of all is not taking into account the relation between quantum and classical infinite. I mean, not taking into account means taking it in the mean field average sense. And then we can try to ask that if I go for these different symmetry breaking solutions. So there are some, there are possible pattern phase which don't break because as I said earlier, the pattern phase must preserve all the symmetry, but it can, it might preserve some symmetry, not all of them. And then we can see what kind of patterns are possible in that way. And then there are some, some more non-trivial things one can do is, which is 
not very difficult to do but there are in principle uh, related problems so one of these is to apply this local chemical potential or this this so if you remember this constant ci up ci up plus ci down ci down equal to 1 for all i so instead of applying at a globe at a local level what we did we did it we did it in this form as an average. So what if we do it as local? So that for that we have to do something called a goods wheeler projection, where you project exactly in that subspace of the Hilbert space. And then we want to add the gauge fluctuations, which we again, as I said, since I applied this constant at, at a look at a global level, not local level, there is no question of this gauge field. This gauge field was static. So what if the gauge field is dynamical? Okay, so this is these are the two things immediate things to understand the stability of this main field theory but it seems it is it, it is going to survive because of the fact that it is comes captured so many aspects of the experiment there is a high chance of all these th these things is going to survive when you go beyond the zero order main field theory so that is roughly the plan for this so that um, basically ends the first part of the talk and then i can talk about the second part of the talk but before that i like to take a pause because it's, I think it's exactly one hour point, a little more than one hour. So, Shantan, uh, what do you say? So, should we go for the second part and the disordered phase, or we should stop mm. here? Or no, we'll no, you can go. go. No problem. Okay. And uh, shall we pause for questions? Yeah. If anybody wants to ask any question, it's welcome. Okay, if not, let's move on to the next part. So the next part is a related spin liquid phase related problem, which is uh, this part work was done with my former advisor Kedar and uh, John and my Rodrish. And the problem we wanted to study is the formation of emergent moments and random singlet physics in a manner of spin liquid. I'll explain in a moment what does all these words mean. And it can be found in this reference that archive of preprint from. So the point of this problem is to understand what is the magnetic response of this quantum spin liquid in the presence of disorder. Now, the, again, I will explain these statements that what is this Marana spin liquid emergent moment and all this means. And we might wonder that what, 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 why do we care for this? Because already a spin liquid is complicated enough, it doesn't order. Then adding disorder, what else it can do? So that is that is what we'll see that adding disorder man can give rise to a, a absolutely new class of phenomena, which are otherwise not possible. Okay. So here is a uh, so let's go for the example for that. And I, my plan of the talk of this part is that first to explain these term, terms like disorder and then what happens. To, so my plan is first to talk about, we, we already talked about what is this quantum spin liquid, but I'll talk about what, what do I mean by disorder and what does it do? And then what is this random singlet phase? And finally, what is a Majorana spin liquid? Okay. okay. And finally, what, what do I expect of this magnetic response and what do I mean by emergent moment? So that is roughly the plan of the talk. So the first point is disorder and random singlet physics. So what do I mean by disorder? So disorder can be of many types. One is, so let's say I have some nice lattice and where the points are like this circle, these small atoms. Now at some location, I can dope some different kind of atoms or I can, as a result, this, this will induce some local, local changes in the Hamiltonian or in the local changes in the problem. And then there could be some distortions like that, where some bonds are distorted longer than others, shorter than others or something. And there, there could be some missing bonds, like completely missing or some non-magnetic, magnetically doped bond, which is equivalent to having a missing site. So what is this? So this is a, this kind of, uh, this disorder, what can they do? What can it do to the low energy physics? So one of the most interesting thing happens in this kind of disorder is a random singlet phase. So what is a random singlet phase? The way we can think about it, that it has some hopping um, Hamiltonian where H is J i S i dot S i plus one. And this J i is drawn from some random distribution. So J i follows some distribution P J i. So 
how do I see, how do I understand a non-random singlet phase is by taking the strongest bonds of this distribution. So if this is my distribution, some PJ versus J. So these are the strongest bond, right? These are the strongest bonds. So they are, they are rare, but they are the strongest one. So identify the strongest bond and consider them as a singlet. They are forming a singlet, a pair bond and throw them away from the system. So this is an effective way to think the effective low energy physics of this problem. This is, why, this is called strong disorder renormalization group. This was done by Das Gupta and my 1980s. So the point is to at each stage form a singlet across the strongest bond and throw them away from the system. So that is the integrating out process and you work out the new effective coupling using a second order perturbation theory. And that new effective coupling is between the next two bonds. Okay? So that is J2 prime J1, J3 by J2. What are you looking for? If you keep doing that, what happens at the low energy? Which means the system form an unique pattern of singlet bonds and go to some infinite randomness fixed point. So I'll explain in a moment, what does that mean? So here is an exercise to see this, work out this effective. So one can start with a, with a pair of, with, with this four spin system with two type of bond and say this J2 is the strongest. So if J2 is the strongest, then I can get rid of, so this is my H0 and this is my H1, okay? So let's say I say this, these two bonds. So I think I flipped it, but anyway, so let's say the J1 and J2 are strongest, not J2. So H0 is my original term and J1 is my perturbation. So then one can do a second order perturbation and work out the effective Hamiltonian. And that will give you this form with in terms of a J2 prime and that should be related to the J1 and J3 with this relation. So now if you continue to do that process, then it shows that in a, in a spin half quantum Heisenberg model on a linear chain, it's unstable with respect to an even infinitesimal exchange disorder. So what does that mean? That if you keep doing that, that's it, the disorder width grows and then you go eventually to a very high disorder fixed point or high long range fixed point. So this process, this process I just described is actually almost impossible to do for a higher dimension or any lattice which co coordination number is greater than two. So non nearest neighbor or 2D or anything like that. So, but there is a lot known from this 1D problem and higher dimension one do this numerical simulation. And what it suggests that the antiferromagnetic order is robust with respect to the exchange disorder, which means the ordered state will dominate even if there is some disorder present. So here is what I mean by when I say disorder grows or disorder reduces, it means that if I have a disorder distribution PJ, so if I do this process and after some time I'll get a new disorder distribution, right? In terms of this new J prime and all that. And I keep doing that. And I will, if I eventually, it turns out that if my disorder distribution becomes that kind of asymptotic, so, so there are very small distribution, almost zero and almost infinity, this kind of an asymptotic distribution. So such a thing is called a infinite disorder fixed point. So there are three categories of cases when the energy scale decreases, the effective disorder can become either smaller and smaller without bound, then the system is controlled by a pure fixed point. It can become larger and larger without bound, then the system is controlled by an infinite decimal fixed point and or it can go to some finite uh, width. So then it is like a finite disorder fixed point. So if you try to think pictorially, we mean to say, what does the system or, or a of freedom sees when it is in the system at very low energy. Does it see effectively a low disorder landscape or a high disordered landscape? And that is not easy to predict a priori. In a normal uh, tight winding hopping model, you can easily see what is happening, but in, in this interacting problem, all these interesting problems happen. And in fact, even as you know, that if when you have off diagonal disorder versus diagonal disorder in a normal tight winding model, they have two completely different phenomena. So the points which are at very low energy, they see an effectively infinite disorder fixed point in that case. So where, where is this, all these things is relevant, at least in the spin problem. So it was actually very well studied in the silicon era, in the rays of silicon era, when people are studying this phosphorus doped silicon. 
So low density of phosphorus dopant in silicon, they have their effective model is some half field Hubbard model with a random lattice. And it's an electrical insulator. And that has the physics, effective physics is that of a spin half local moments. And this GIJ, so you can write down effective model of a, forms a broad distribution, but note this is a 3D problem. So in 3D, you cannot execute this program analytically or with like, or at least asymptotically exact, but there are some effective numerical uh, schemes to do that. And that's what showed that they have the singlet pairs, the system settles in some low energy singlet pair, broad distribution of binding energy. And it was shown that these pairs with binding energy less than T, and the, the, if the number of pairs with binding energy less than T at a given temperature, then effectively the system has this form of, just a moment, effectively the system has this form or, or susceptibility, which is of T to the power alpha minus one, that is basically the signature of this kind of a phase, a, a susceptibility with this kind of a power law dependence magnetic susceptibility and this is the effective exponent that was the famous work of Bhatt and Lee in 1984 and this slows very slowly at finite range depending on concentration p that was the phenomenological thing and people uh, hope that this is probably a random singlet phase in 3d so now as i said that in 1d this picture is asymptotically exact for random exchange antiferromagnetic change but 3d it is not so for greater than dimension one there are the statement is there is an random singlet phenomenology, which means the chi has this property t to the power alpha minus one over a broad temperature range. But since it's a phenomenological statement, it's not a well, it's a it's a it's known to some good degree of confidence, but there is no asymptotically exact scheme to do that in this region. So that is what uh, we try to fill that gap in some special models. I'll come to that. So uh, just to um, uh, recap or, or just to uh, tell a little bit about this random singlet phenomenology in greater than one dimension, very recent uh, experiments. So there was some, a bunch of work in last two, three years where people have renewed interest in this subject. So one work was actually, I didn't cite it here, this came up like a few days back, I think, in our, there was about this disordered spin liquid. Uh, and uh, not archive, it was published in PRL, I think. So one thing is this possibility of random singlet physics in bond disordered valence bond solid phase, which is close to some spin liquid state. And this is partially motivated, and this experiment or this theory was partially motivated by this particular compound and their physics. And uh, this discuss about a possibility of such a phase in, in the spin liquid PBS phase. And then there is some numerical evidence for that in this in, in using a class of model called JQ model. So uh, another uh, exp example is also a relatively recent example of this doped alpha ruthenium chloride, which is a ketab material, and that's actually more close to the problem we are we are going to describe here. Okay, so now let's talk about. Uh, the and another more experiment I would like to mention. This is actually not an experiment, but this is they looked at all the data from these particular compounds and compiled and tried to construct a phenomenology by looking at the specific heat susceptibility and magnetization as a function of temperature and magnetic field and identified random spin liquid phenomenology. So this situation is basically begging for a theoretical understanding, which is not uh, just approximate, but perhaps at least asymptomatically exact. And that is what we try to do here. Okay, so as I said that this is, uh, these arguments are saying that the distributions don't broaden indefinitely, but as you know, these are phenomenology, you cannot go at arbitrarily low temperature, but that is what is roughly, we know that this has this chi t to the power alpha minus one type of behavior. Okay, so here is our work. And our work, so this is a complete summary of the whole work. I will give, give in next few points and then I will elaborate on that. So we see a random singlet phenom like susceptibility of a dilute SU2 symmetric Marana spin liquid. I'll explain the point in a moment. But dilute means I remove randomly delete sites, which is basically a site dilution, or if you try to think experimentally, it's doping of non magnetic impurity. So this is a tractable example of a disordered 
So our example is a tractable example because it's an asymptotically exact calculation on an exact model. And this is for the SU2 symmetric spin liquid in 2D. And this is the form of the susceptibility we get. We get a N gamma T by 4T, which is when translated in this language, it is basically responsible for, for this T to the power alpha minus one form. And this is a Curie part. So it will have a Curie part plus a random singlet part. And the, we will explain that the Curie part is coming because of some zero modes of the problem or zero mode or EQ that's equivalent to say some spin, some special kind of spin textures. So the N gamma T that is of course tells you whether the form of the N gamma T that has to be consistent with the random singlet phases and that's what we find. And this form is gamma T to the power. So this, I'm just writing this whole thing in a slightly different language or gamma T is log one by J by T. So let's take J equal to one, so log one by T. So this is the form we find that this gamma t to the power minus y and this n gamma t is of this form when, so there is a crossover in behavior in the temper with temperature. So at low temperature, it is this form and higher temperature, it is of this form. And this gives the effective exponent alpha t, which is this t to the power chi t to the power alpha t. So chi as t to the power alpha t alpha t minus one. So this alpha is also dependent on temperature, but this gives the effective exponent. And this Curie part, this density gives the, uh, the free moments, which means the moments which doesn't form any singlet with anyone, even at arbitrarily low energy. As I said, the random singlet, the random singlet phase is basically forming singlet at very far, far apart. Spins can form singlet at some low energy scale. But apparently this system shows there will be some spins which never form any singlet when there's some free, effectively free distribution exists, some islands like that exist. So these are some composite large length scale objects. So this is the main points of our work. That's the main result in, in one slide. Now let's go on to see what, uh, what model we do and how did we find that? And what does it mean by this? So, here I present a exactly solvable model of Majorana spin liquid. The model is following that I have a, so the model is origin, inspired by the Kitaev's honeycomb model, which has a three type of speed interaction. One is JX, JY, and JZ. So the X, Y, and Z, by that I mean these bonds. So I call them X, call them Y, call them Z, just three indices. So X, will they are like three Ising terms. So X will try to stabilize this these spins, Z will try to stabilize in some other direction and Y will try to stabilize in some other direction. Because of all three, there is a frustration. So this is a highly frustrated model. And the ground state is a superposition of all these com combinations, all these combinations, these, 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 and all these. Four. It's a highly degenerate ground state. It's a frustrated model. And interestingly, so I will just keep the details a bit because it's a quite late. So interestingly, this model has an exact solution. So one can map this problem. So one can show there are this multi, the product of the spins in each, each honeycomb is a placket, and that is a conserved quantity. It commutes with the Hamiltonian. And this is this loop uh, degrees of freedom. So this model was originally introduced with a completely different purpose. There is a famous paper of Kitab in 2006 on topological quantum computation. And that model had some property which are useful in that context, but turns out it is also useful in this context. So let's keep the details and let's go to that quickly go to the point that how this model is solved. So to solve that model, you write again this each fermion in terms of this spin, the spin on or this uh, fermion operators. But here the advantage is because of the peculiar geometry and peculiar structure of the model, these objects doesn't have this non-local gauge field or something. It has just a static gauge field, a static background, which is exactly solvable. You don't have to take this gauge fluctuation approximation or anything. So it is like every site, every spin is made of three Majorana fermion B and another Majorana fermion C. So four Majorana fermion. And you can write down an effective model in terms of this Majorana fermion. So this is how it looks like. So every spin, is basically this collection of these four Majorana fermions. Okay. So let me again skip some details and tell you that you can write the effectively the model in terms of this, which is a hopping model, which has no interaction because it's a artifact of the structure, but the gauge field gets 
the gauge fluctuation gets static and it's all exact. So you get a pure hopping model where the C's are Majorana fermion, not regular fermion. And there is an I sitting in front. And then this AI is, has to be this skew symmetric structure to make the whole thing Hermitian. Okay, so now it has these properties as you see that because of this, as I said, the skew symmetric structure and all that. So this model has all these phases of spin liquid, which one can work out exactly by its famous work by Baskaran who showed that the spin liquid phases are there. So one thing is that it, it is a gap spin liquid. So this kind of diagram is called a ternary diagram. So you have to plot these three axes and look at this plane, this one plane of that. So this region is a gap spin liquid. This gap spin liquid is gapped and this region is a gapless in the center with algebraic correlation. So here is a SU2 symmetry, but this model, as you can see, this model doesn't have a rotational symmetry because these X, Y, and Z, they are different and they are pointing in different direction. So to make it rotational symmetric, <clears throat> there is another model called Yaoli model. What one does that one replaces each vertex by a triangle of three spins, and then one can construct an effective low energy theory for this model. Where, so the model is following that every site Construct, combine these three spins and write down a model for these three these spins. And when you project it in its low, so you can show there is a doublet phase. When you project it in the low energy phase of this model, you get an effective model, which looks like this. So this is the projection part of each spin. And it looks like this. So that is the bottom line. Let me not go over all the details. And this is just like a Heisenberg term multiplied by some I multiplied by some uh, Kitab like form, but because of this term, overall this thing is SU2 symmetric. So that means it is the closest possible cousin of a Heisenberg model, which is exactly solvable. That's why we are looking at at least symmetry wise. And then that can be solved with a slightly different construction of Marana fermion. It was like Sastri Sen who worked on this in 96. And there was this Coleman Miranda Sevali also worked on this 93, where you replace each spin by a pair of Majorana fermion like that. And then that is again doubles your Hilbert space. You use the projection, come back. It's the same story as the other, but it's all exact. So now you start with the spin model and then you go to this Majorana fermion space. Then it, then it becomes a free fermion model, a lattice, a hopping tight binding type model with a fluctuating gauge field. So there is a gauge term at each term, at each bond. Yeah. And if you couple it with a magnetic field, if you turn on a magnetic external magnetic field that shows up like this. Now with a bit of, a little bit of uh, algebra, you can show that the magnetic susceptibility of the original spin model is related to the, uh, to the compressibility of this free fermion gas. So if you compute the, density of state of this free fermion gas. So this is the only point to remember of this free fermion gas. From there, you can transform this and get the magnetic susceptibility of this spin model because of this mapping between this free fermion and the, but there is, as I said, there is the catch that there is this EYJ gauge field and that has to satisfy some property. It is not just the fermionic model, okay? So, Question is why study disorder in this peculiar model? The model apparently is peculiar because it's exactly solvable. To get that exact solvability, you need something peculiar. Well, first is of course, because you can do that because it's not easy to do that for any other realistic model, which is uh, the Heisenberg model and one can only do something numerical, but it's here it is at least asymptotically exact, not perturbative or there's no approximation involved in this calculation. That is why we are doing it. And symmetry wise, it's same as the Heisenberg model because they due to symmetry. The second thing is that this is not entirely an unrealistic model because as I said, that there are this transition metal iridate and ruthenium chloride, which are basically key type model plus perturbation. So if I consider that perturbation to be relevant, which I don't, I can't do that a priori, but let's assume that for sake, for now that it's irrelevant, then relevant in the sense that scale of perturbation is smaller much, much smaller. Then we can say at least, what is the physics of the Kitab model? Then I say, if I add perturbation, does it change qualitatively or not? So that will be the final question that what if we add the Heisenberg terms? The third thing, this, as I, this is actually something we, I already said that this is an opportunity to study non-trivial spaces because of disorder. 
which are otherwise not there and because and it's an exactly solvable which is a very important point okay so here is uh, what do we know about this kind of problem so we know that in this as i said that i connected this problem with the 1d hopping disorder problem or 1d um, uh, non interacting problem with some subtlety and that subtlety is important but let's ignore the subtlety for the time being we know what happened in this dimension one by pattern random hopping it has this divergence at the zero energy which is related to some uh, a criticality and that was the dyson form of density of state you will get it in this form and one can do a control strong disorder renormalization group for this problem to understand why it is comes and one can show that it comes because of this log log of this coupling energies it becomes infinitely broad at low energy so it has an infinite disorder fixed point and 2d is much more non trivial and that problem was done much much later and people have worked out this particular form this is the garde wegener form and this shows that the strong disorder effect and there are two different ways to do it one is just doing this uh, mapping it to some effective random walk problem numerically and finally the field theory non linear sigma model confirmation that came one year later to that okay so how much time okay let me try to wrap up in um, 10 15 minutes so now if i what do i do operationally i start with this hopping model and delete some sites so here is some site deleted some site deleted and all that by balancing the a and b subtleties because i am interested in the chiral limit okay? so this is my delete probability the hopping a uh, zero is some probability here and non zero is some other probability so that is the form of disorder we are interested in and that means the system has this chiral symmetry so now what happens to the low energy physics so this is a controversial question actually it's a very controversial question because there is a recent calculation from this mirlin group and then by the uh, evers group have shown one is concurrent numerical invariance and field theory non linear sigma model calculation that this 2d system in the presence of site dilution the density of state will behave like a 1d problem which is very peculiar and very counterintuitive but there are this lots of verification of that and what we said in that so this is another recent paper we wrote which is cont contradictory to that and we said no no it is not a new class of uh, phenomena but rather it's a it's the same thing except the fact same thing qualitatively except the fact that you have to go at low enough energy and there is a density dependent crossover by density i mean how many site you knocked off density dependent crossover where you see a particular form of divergence and at lower density you see a higher density you see a different type of form uh, not higher density sorry at lower energy you will see a different form of divergence and at how low energy you have to go for that is dependent on the density of the disorder so that is qualitatively the whole result about this uh, density induced low energy uh, density of states sorry uh, defect induced low energy density of states and that is an useful in this context because this system is symmetry wise is in the same class except some difference that because of these gauge terms because of this uh, because of this static gauge field there is uh, there there are some some difference in this problem between this and that but as we'll see that will not change anything qualitatively okay so now this is the problem so operationally what we do we start with the site disorder site dilution problem and then we know that the physics of this problem comes because of the vacancy wave function for the site so if you delete a site the corresponding wave function lives in the opposite side sub lattice if it is in a particular sub lattice and the because of mixing between these two wave function the low energy then states comes because of that mixing and the lowest scale of the problem if it is a gap system it can be very tiny which means if my if this is my scale this is the scale of the problem e to the power minus d where d is the distance between one disorder and another disorder a distance like this and this distance is order of 100 means this number is very tiny so it's a very low energy physics and actually one can think if lhc versus the room temperature ratio is like 10 to the power 14 in the upside the downside this is minus 10 to the minus 44 so that's to get an estimate of how low it is okay 
So now what do we do? We make a grid in the energy. In, so we use a particular theorem of Lie algebra called Strom theorem to calculate this density of states. And we form a grid in the, in the energy space, which is logarithmic. It's uniform, but in, in the gamma space or logarithmic space, that means it's actually a, a logarithmically decreasing density of state to, to capture the detailed features of the low energy. And when we do that, so I'll skip this point because there is some argument about how the renormalization group should be done for this kind of problem, but I'll skip that point. And here, what we'll see for the integrated density of state. So we see two clear regimes. So one regime is the low energy. So this, how to read this? So this gamma, remember this gamma is log one by E. So that means the smaller the E, larger the gamma. And that if I look at this, and this is the integrated density of states. So if I look at that, the blue part is the, is the 1D form, effective 1D form, and that's a high energy phenomena. But as I go to low energy, I can see it deviates clearly and significantly from that, and there is a crossover scale for that. And this deviation is what you expect actually in these 2D problems, this cardio wagner form. So these are the thermodynamic limit extrapolations for that result. And now the other point I wanted to make earlier, so this result is for the non-interacting problem, but in this problem, notice there is something called Leap's theorem, which makes this thing different from the other. So you can show in this, in this problem that if, I, if you introduce some, uh, some side dilution, or, or so the general statement is that if I have a gauge term, which is fluctuating, or it, it is flexible to be plus or minus one, then the system will like to be in a phase <clears throat> where any closed placket, which is of size 4n plus 2, 4n plus 2, must have a flux 0, and size 4n must have a flux 5. So now if I have this honeycomb, this honeycomb, these are plackets of size 6, so they have flux 0. But if I remove a site, this bigger placket is of size 12, so it must enclose a flux 5. So let's say I flip the sign of this bond, hopping in this bond to make that flux pi. But that will disturb the next, next placket. So I have to introduce another flux pi. And that will go on. So that will make this whole thing non-local. Non so you have a gauge fluctuation which is non-local just because of one impurity. And that can stop only in another in impurity. So that is the qualitative and major change between this model and the non-interacting model. But it turns out when you do that, when you put all these, these gauge string, this non-local gauge string, or this flux string, not gauge string, so they, then you will see that it's qualitatively still the same because it's the same symmetry sector. So when we do that, this is the result. I come back to that result side I already showed. I see that there are some zero modes. Zero modes means zero eigen energy solution. And these zero modes will give you a response like this. And the C is proportional to the density of this zero mode which when translated in the spin language, there are some free moments, plus some random singlet response, which is of this matches the random singlet phenomenology. And that is basically the picture of this problem. So as I said that there is, there, there is some mismatch with the previous work, but still qualitatively, at least this particular work doesn't show any difference between this. And the mismatch is following because there is this paper by Willan Chokar and Moisner for Kitab model, which shows even for gap phase, you get a Dyson, Dyson form, which is not something we expect. Okay, so I will skip this couple of slides here because there is some details about these forms and about the zero mode. But here I'll show the zero mode spin texture. So if I plot the spin texture, if I translate the zero eigenvalue solution to a spin texture, this is how it looks like. This is an effectively free moment which doesn't contribute to the random singlet part. And that is, the spec that is how the texture looks like. So these are the two main conclusion. The first is we can see a random singlet phenomenology in an exactly solvable uh, SU2 symmetric model, which have a Marana spin liquid state. And the key ingredients are there that the low temperature susceptibility is controlled by this flow to strong, which is the signature of a random singlet phase. And the presence of these emergent free moments, which is associated to the zero modes. So that is basically the main conclusion and then the open threads are to think of doing a stability of these results and be, in, with respect to when we go away from the exactly solvable limit. You know? And then 
to understand the gap to gapless transition because as i said earlier when i go from gap to gapless phase this wilhans chakar moizna seem to say it is the same one d uh, dyson form which is surprising and it should not happen and we are in the process of right writing up that that it is not like that okay so that is all and uh, that's all i wanted to say and let's have some questions and uh, otherwise and i think it's i almost so if, if uh, first of all okay and then uh, <clears throat> i have to say thank you for giving this talk and i am seeing that everybody left and then can me i can able to hear you you can able to hear me is my down hello can you hear me yeah i can't hear you uh, now you can hear me yeah so suddenly i i my connection was disconnected yeah yeah so i couldn't uh, yeah so i am done basically yeah yeah i i can understand but yeah. i think, uh, thank you for very much for this contribution and i'm seeing only one student ask him if yeah yeah i know he... no no that's okay this is my he is my student so we can talk uh, of course but yeah okay so yeah uh, so yeah i think it's almost two hour we can close the meeting and we can have this discussion oh, that's that's good yeah. uh, like i mostly prefer students to ask question because i i think since it is a long talk some of the students left Yeah, but there are anyway very few students. It's just I saw students. Well, <laughs> anyways, yeah, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyways, uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Contribution and uh, this will be posted in YouTube channel and then once. This yeah, I know. I will share the link with you and uh, and I'm also preferring if somebody is listening this talk later. If you have any. Specific... Yeah, yeah, I think that is the main point. Yeah. Uh, then you please write to him because yeah. then you can ask him any if there is any difficulty to ask. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Understand any part of the talk or maybe some of the like some help if you want from him, so you can directly talk to him. And uh, yeah, that's 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 what I want to say. And. Uh, yeah like thank you for this contribution and like stay safe and healthy that's very important yeah same to you stay safe and healthy yeah so are you at nicer now or are you at home no, i'm not at nicer i'm in right now with my mother not at home okay, okay. i'm right now at kuch bihar okay okay so because my sister is staying there and our kolkata home is right now closed oh okay okay Uh, I see, and I am not preferring to like put my mother at Kolkata right now because I, uh, you know that the pandemic situation at Kolkata is not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this place is quite safer than. Yeah, Kolkata, makes so sense. That's why I came and. Uh, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Probably I will go very soon. Go back to Nizar, but yeah, like this month there are lots of conferences. and interviews this did that going on because the, from today there is something called pre strings starts okay and the next week there is a yeah this is a preparatory school right yeah and the next week there is a string conference and also with pre strings there is another parallel uh, one which is string math which also started so, hmm. and uh, there is another what is the string conference where is what is this, this one is, the this, indian one or the international one no no this is this is the usual international one the people are organizing different part of the world every time this time it is oh, okay. brazil and the, you can understand that there is a huge time gap between brazil and india yeah yeah of course <laughs> so they just have started now so okay. i can't able to attend because it is not possible for me to attend for long night uh mm. yeah maybe like since i am at home it's not possible for me but uh, yeah i will try to see some of them and yeah and there is another conference lots of conferences going on this month so there is something called pasco mm 
So I have to give a talk there. So which is uh, day after uh, that is also in Korean time. So mm -hmm. it is probably um, in the daytime here. So like I have to keep track. Early morning. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I have to always keep track which time zone it is and this it's mm -hmm. too much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, right, where are you right now? Right now you are at. Uh, I'm at Tirupati. At Tirupati. Okay. So you have to take classes and all. It's summer now. It's only project students and all. So in yeah. some way, right now. In August now, it will start. Classes will start in August. August it will start, but. What is what kind of climate there? It is right now very. It's good actually. I I I kept I when I came here I heard it will be very hot, but yeah. it is not. It's very pleasant. It's better than Kolkata summer because Kolkata summer is humid. This is better very, than. Very 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 humid. Yeah, here unless you are in sun, it's fine. Ah. Yeah. yeah, I told you if there is some kind of possibilities, let me know. Yeah, let's talk about all those things. Yeah. Yeah, but sure. uh, right now I'm not talking about it here. Yeah, yeah, of course it is like quite late, and I'll mm -hmm. talk about it later. So, anyway. Okay. So, I tell you I'm feeling yeah. very tired after giving such a long talk because at that long talk you have given. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very long actually. No, I'm not saying you are. Sorry. The, I'm saying. No, I skipped many things. No, no, I'm not blaming you. I'm saying that this is itself a very yeah. big talk, not yours. All the talks are very big. Yeah. So yeah, I, I know that's what I saw in the YouTube. So and it is so going I to be stay in YouTube. Most of, the time, most of the time, after giving the talk, speakers are feeling like, oh my God, I want to go. I want to go. It's kind no, of. No, no, it is not that much. <laughs> because, uh, uh, yeah, I not that much because this is our group meeting no, but, and etc. Initially, I these days I'm writing one more sentence when I have invited you. I didn't uh, hmm. written that that you can speak more or less. So yeah, some. But people, uh, since I saw all other talks are like two hour, two and a half. Yeah, some people take. Uh, not all other, at least some talks. I saw Gautam. Gautam talk is like oh, two uh, and a half. Gautam talk. So okay. then I thought, why more, not? More than two and a half hour, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I thought, yeah, why not? Yeah. Uh, anyway, it will be in YouTube, so let it be there. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> No, no, it's okay now. I'm not saying anything, but uh, anyways, yeah. I feel you are also tired. So let's talk yeah. about all other things later and stay safe yeah. and free with your family. And yeah, same to you. Bye for now. Okay. Yeah, bye.